Thanks, Patrick. So the mic is on, right? Um, so I'm happy to be here. Thanks for the invitation. So yeah, I'll talk about creativity, aesthetics, and deep reasoning, and I'll say what that is or what I'm trying to make it be. Um, so I think you know we can define the computer vision task as basically, given an image or video, we aim to recognize objects, actions, and events, right? So that's really the core technology, and that's what we're all doing for the most part. But are we really recognizing or just labeling? Think about that for a second. I think we're just labeling, but I'll, I'll go into the details of this. Um, and that's not enough. And the reason that it's not enough is because, you know, we've all heard the, an image is worth a thousand words, but in reality, it means many different levels, right? And a lot of this comes from psychology, and, you know, studies have shown that people label things or refer to things at many different levels, and mostly at what's called the generic level. So if you look at a chair, you'll say, you know, you'll say this is a chair. Anyone you ask, they'll say it's a chair. You know, few people will go and start describing it. You know, it's a leather chair. It has this, this, and that. So that's kind of the generic level. And in the early days of computer vision and image retrieval, we dealt mostly with the syntactic level, where we looked at colors, textures, and so on and so forth. Um, and now we're more into semantics, where the generic level, again, again you know, refers to that basic category if you think of people, that, that's basically face detection, where we say there's a face. The specific level, we're talking about who, whose face it is, right? We're naming that specific object. Um, and the abstract, so the specific one, you can see there Angelina Jolie. Um, and at the abstract level, then we're saying, okay, she's happy, she's sad. You know, what is the scene really representing? And that's, I think, the most relevant towards the future. And I think that's where things are going, and that's where we need to go. So the question is, how do we do that. And, and, you know, if you think of search results nowadays, um, for the most part, they're fairly accurate, right? I mean, you can search for images and you get the right images. Um, so what is the challenge now? The challenge is if we get mostly the right images, the next step is to get the highest quality images, the most creative images, the most creative videos, right? But can creativity be learned? Can machine learning help us with that? Um, what about aesthetics and interestingness? Can we find interesting images and, and aesthetically pleasing images and videos automatically. So those are the questions that, that we're trying to address. And as Patrick said, you know, one of the ways of doing this is to use a human-centered approach. And what this means is you know, thinking out of the box in terms of computer vision and actually um, you know, putting into the realm of human-centered computing, which essentially is at the intersection of what I call user experience, data analysis, and human aspects. So everything that we do has to be at the intersection of these three components, especially when you think about products and actual real-world applications. We need to understand the users, understand the data, understand the user experience. You know, what do each of the buttons on the app do? What does each link on the web page do? What is, you know, what is the effect of the design, the colors, the, the, you know, the, the size of the links? the fonts, et cetera, et cetera. In terms of the human aspects, the cognitive abilities of, of the people searching, when they search for X, do they mean X or Y? What is the right level of interpretation of that search? And that, if you think just in terms of search, um, understanding that completely changes the way you design not only the interface, but also the way that you design um, the algorithms that take the query and map it, or expand it, or contract it, right? The indexing. So at every single level, you need to look at the human aspects. So that, that's, that's where the, the work should, should focus. I think that's where a lot of our work focuses. So how do we, how do, we do this? Um, so as Patrick said, well done, you know, combination of qualitative and quantitative methods, I think, is, is the right answer. Um, and so in order to do this, what we actually do is we have sort of three starting points. It could be the data, it could be hypotheses, or it could be the design, right? And so the basic idea is, you know, we start with this. I'll give you one example, which is not, I'm not covering in the talk. We did a large-scale study of uh, image search, and we found that a lot of people search for celebrities, right? Not that surprising. Um, but then we started looking at sessions, exactly how people behave within the sessions, the different strategies, and so on and so forth. So that was a data, you know, we, we used data as a starting point, analyzed over a billion queries. Based on that data, 
um, we found certain results, then we changed our hypotheses. We found that most people were actually using the initial query to browse within categories. So somebody searching for Angelina Jolie typically will look at many, many photos of Angelina Jolie, not just one. And if you think about it, that's a very different paradigm from text web search, where the idea is that you search for one thing, you get it immediately, and you bounce out, right? That's kind of the idea. With image search, it's completely different. You, you issue one query, and then you continue. Because you're actually browsing. You're interested in seeing more than one image. You're interested in many images. So you start with data, then you go to the hypotheses, and then based on that, we redesign the product, redesign the algorithms, and the cycle continues back and forth. So as you do that, you do it thinking of a specific user, um, and then you cycle back and forth between these different elements within a specific context. So um, I'm going to talk about some examples of uh, some of the work that we're doing along these lines. So post portrait aesthetics, creativity in videos, deep reasoning in video, and video highlights. Um, so portrait aesthetics. So um, the specific problem that we're trying to solve here, um, and you can think of many applications of this in search and thumbnail generation and so on and so forth, is we want to automatically be able to find the best images and the best single image for every single celebrity in the world. So this is tens and tens of thousands, right? So a lot of these people I don't even know, and these are you know, the top, sort of the top ones. But if you start thinking of celebrities in India and, and countries in Africa, you know, it's, it, it becomes a hard problem. So we want to, first assumption, okay, we can find enough images of that celebrity. Second one is aesthetics. Um, and you can see that when you start working on this, you find a lot of interesting um, complex uh, research issues. So you can see Sarkozy with his hands, you know, in front of him. In his case, that's a pretty good portrait because that's sort of, you know, who he is, right? He moves his hands a lot, so it's a pretty decent portrait of himself. With the queen, the same thing. You know, she has a hat. She almost always has a hat, so that's a good portrait. But most people don't, you know, they shouldn't have hats. On the other hand, if you look at uh, uh, race car drivers, they usually have caps, which is kind of weird because they don't really need them, right? <laughs> they have helmets. But anyway, um, and then you see the guy at the bottom with the, be with the beer. I'm not sure who, who that is. Um, and then you see somebody like Katy Perry, whose hair color is changing constantly. So you want to have you know, the most recent hair color. If, if it's an athlete, you want to have the uniform that's recent, right? Um, and then if you look at the detail, details, there are objective and subjective quality metrics, including you know, the composition, whether they're looking, their eyes are closed, open, et cetera, et cetera. Um, and, and again, the, the applications of this in search and in, in, you know, in, in many other uh, areas. So what we did for this one and the details, I'm not going to go over the technical details because a lot of this work is published. Um, so this is in face and gesture of this year. So we take portraits, we extract a number of features um, based on aesthetic literature. And then we do a large-scale analysis of these portraits and we build classifiers. And so we basically find that beautiful portraits are uncorrelated with um, the, the photographic beauty of these portraits is uncorrelated with race, age, and gender. Um, but it's actually strongly correlated with sharpness of facial landmarks, contrast exposure, how homogeneous they are, illumination patterns, uniqueness, and origin originality, right? Um, the second one is creativity in videos. This is an example of a creative video. And what we wanted to do here was you know, given videos like the cat and the other video, you know, which one would you say is creative and which one is not, right? Obviously the one with the cherry because it's paper and so on and so forth. So we wanted to figure out whether we could build classifiers to distinguish, not between a cat and this one, but in general, creative versus non-creative videos. What's a creative video? It has an aesthetic value, evokes an emotion, content is interesting, original, or surprising. And then we use crowdsourcing, um, and we asked a bunch of people to annotate videos to collect the training set and tell us whether a video was creative or not, uh, five judgments per video, and we had an agreement of about 84%. And then based on this, you know, on, on people telling us why we designed the features at multiple levels, again, sensory features, effective features, um, visual novelty features, audio novelty features, and, and then we built a framework to do the automatic classification and we found that the creative features um, are the ones that you see here. So scene content, novelty, loop, and so on and so forth, non-creative things like camera shake and, and so on and so forth. And this gives us about 80% accuracy in creative versus non-creative. 
Now with video, and I'll just go to like through two slides and then show some demos, hopefully, if I have time. Uh, this is kind of the standard thing you do, right? You do labeling, and you, you get a bunch of labels. The problem is, you know, uh, since each of these uh, classifiers is typically trained independently, there will be conflicts between them. It's impossible to see what the relationship is and to get higher levels of abstraction. So what we're trying to do is think of it in terms of understanding and the fact that we have basic level categories, objective metrics, and subjective metrics. And then, again, if you look at the research in psychology, and these are human tests, you know, if you take foreground and background images and you mix them, people, people get confused and their uh, classification accuracy goes down. People's classification accuracy. They're, they're not able to distinguish a you know, football player between somebody else if the background changes. So what we're trying to do is build using deep learning or other le learning algorithms, build reasoning engines on top of that with added knowledge to uh, obtain structural labels. So this is the basic idea, that for a specific scene, and then across the video, you get kind of hierarchies and graphs that relate the different concepts that we're able to detect, and um, also try to find, again, creative um, highlights of, of video. So let me move over oh, to, the, to the demo very quickly. Hopefully I will have time. Um, okay, so this one I'm going to run live right now. So I, I, these are all the settings. I enter the URL here. And this automatically finds highlights of video. So while it's running, I'll show the other ones. So with this one, we get the basic tags. And what you see here is how they're expanded using our reasoning engine. So it gives you kind of an idea of, of what, you know, what we're doing. Um, this one here is showing you the hierarchy and how it shifts over time. And of course, you know, it's, it's work in progress. So you'll see some mistakes here and there. But the basic idea is that, that again, there are multiple levels. And one of the big challenges is when you're doing recommendation, discovery, and so on and so forth, is what is the right level? At which level do you match with, with uh, users, right? Um, this is a different view of the tags, which show you, you know, how prevalent they are at a specific point in time and, and where they appear within the sequence. Redesign me. Oops. Redesign me. Sorry, let me stop. Make this. me Otherwise. better. Um, and this one here is for ads. So what it's doing is you know, finding the, the best ads. So these are the ads on the right-hand side that match a specific video. So I can pick any, any video, and hopefully I'll get a decent one. Yeah, so this is the ad that you get. And let's see. So it, yeah, it's kind of a nature video. So the ad is wrong. This is how they're sorted. And then on this one here, we have search. So if I search for sport, let's see what videos I get. There. No I'm funny, rookie, Couchman. Yeah. Rookie bait. Um, electronics. I have about this a minute one. left. It so also this has USB clear electric. So this is fully automatic, right? We didn't do any hand picking but at all. Um, now, the other, the other one that I wanted to show you uh, where we're using the aesthetic and the creativity features is in automatically finding highlights and generating summaries of videos. So this is an example of the uh, Super Bowl um, performance. And this is an automatically generated summary of the highlights of the performance. So it's 15 seconds. And this is, no, sorry, this is shorter. And this is a, the summary video, which is, I think, fires and Katy Perry. You know, just a few oh seconds. My. Katie did a little ditty with fun dancing island stuff. Okay, so that's the summary. And let me show you the one that we just generated. Oh, it's still right. There it is. Wow, perfect timing. <laughs> Not too bad. So that's like a 10-minute video. So it's, it's faster than real time in the sense that, you know, it, it, it did it faster than, than, uh, than the video plays. And, and it, it took a few minutes. Um, and here's the summary of the video. I haven't actually watched. So. Okay, so, um, and then the nice thing with this is you can actually 
In addition to that, you can select any part of the video to generate animated GIFs. So that's what you're seeing there. You know, when I move the blue thing, it's, it's helping me, oops. There, it'll, it'll generate the animated GIF for that particular segment. Okay, so um, to wrap up, what are the biggest challenges? Um, I think the right level of indexing is one. Uh, the scalability of training sets. I, I love the previous talk because it, it talked about that. Now, when we think about creativity and aesthetics, um, the problem is that you know, just finding all the cat images or all the videos of skies or you know, base jumps is not enough. We need to additionally have signals that tell us which are the better ones. And that's where social media comes in. And that's an area that we're very, very closely focusing, you know, using all of this external data to help us with, the, with a scalable training sets. And what is the right reasoning approach? You know, this idea of reasoning is not new. It's been around in the past. And I think it's going to resurface for the reasons that I explained. Uh, so thank you very much. There are papers for a lot of this work. And let me know if you have any questions. I'd be happy to.